Hi Spring fans, welcome to another installment of Spring Tips. In this installment, we're going to look at uh, the solution to a very common problem. Something that I grant you is a little bit uh, of a sort of small corner case uh, in the ecosystem, but one that nonetheless kind of intrigues a lot of people who start to think about it, which is, how do I propagate state across the sort of different stages of a reactive pipeline? So think about what happens here in the reactive world. In stark contrast to the more traditional approaches to to uh, handling web requests and to uh, and to addressing those kinds of concerns in the reactive world, code uh, uh, is not guaranteed to execute on a given thread. So this is, uh, as I say, different than what you might have expected when using uh, the reactive, uh, sorry, the non-reactive code uh, in, for example, a servlet engine. In a servlet engine, you have a uh, unless you specify otherwise, by default, it's one thread per request. So a, re a request comes in and there's a thread that's hosting that request and the response that gets produced for that request uh, and that all happens in the context of a single thread and so machinery you know mechanisms that we are uh, with with which we are accustomed uh, things like thread locals those serve us well in those use cases but they start to fall apart as soon as you introduce asynchronicity that is to say the possibility that work will hop to a different thread of execution this is a very real possibility in the world of uh, reactive programming, where execution can very easily, very often, hop uh, threads of uh, you know hop from one thread to another in the in the process of producing a response. So, how do we solve this? And we do need to solve this, right? This is this is something that has to be solved um, in order to address things like transaction management and demarcation, and to, in order to address things like uh, security context propagation, right? These are things that Spring itself relies upon at lower levels. Uh, but with which you uh, may not have to directly uh, interact. It's a concern with which you may not have to directly interact, but that needs to be addressed, right? Today, we're going to look at that mechanism. It's called the reactor context. <clears throat> so build an application called the React. We just use, we're just going to use the reactive web support here. Nothing else. Oh, Lumbach. We'll use Lumbach to make my life a little easier. We'll hit generate. That'll give us a new zip file, which I'll... I'll then open up here we go and <clears throat> we're gonna demonstrate a very simple example first we're gonna demonstrate just you know a simple rest endpoint uh, that produces some data and we'll take a look at um, how we can use that data Okay, so let's suppose in our basic application, this is, we're going to build a new application. Let's just get rid of this one. Get rid of the basic one here. I'll create one called, um, well, let's see. We want to create a new package, I suppose. We'll create that first. So simple. And then in the simple package, we're going to create a new class called the simple uh, application. All right. And this will just be just like any other Spring Boot application, it'll be a public static void main. Okay, orgs. And I appreciate that IntelliJ is trying to remind me after 25 years that I should uh, I should uh, have the brackets next to the type instead of the argument uh, variable name like that, which is what I've been doing. So if I do that, it gives me the yellow uh, highlight around the, around the variable name. Thank you. And I've been doing that because I came from C, so... Sorry, background. So anyway, spring application <laughs> dot run simple application dot class. And what we're going to do is very simple. When the application starts up, we're going to have a rest endpoint. So we're going to call this just data. And we're going to return some data. Okay. And that data will come from a publisher. We're going to create that publisher in a second. We want this to be a rest controller, of course. So we'll say at rest controller. And we're just going to provide some data. So where do we get that publisher? Well, a flux of string. Now keep in mind, this is a reactive publisher. It's a reactive stream. It's going to emit items of data that a subscriber can then subscribe to and process on different threads. It may be in one nanosecond, it may be one year, right? There's no guarantee really of temporal sort of coupling, okay? So what we're going to do is we're going to build a publisher that returns just a Let's just do something simple. Let's say we're going to create a publisher that has names or letters, I guess we can call flux.just a, b, c. Okay? And then we're going to have a flux of 
integer. All right, numbers. Flux dot just one two three. All right, good. Now we've got that. Now we need to let's compose them. Let's say flux dot zip numbers dot map tuple, and we're going to take the tuple dot get t one, concatenate it with a colon and tuple dot get t two. Is this useful? No, but it does demonstrate we're we're creating publishers. We're creating pipelines. Okay, so combined, and uh, we're then gonna send that back. Now, um, I want this data to. I want these publishers to first of all announce where they are and what on what thread they're running, uh, and then I also want them to uh, to possibly run on a separate thread. So I'm gonna create a method here, private. Uh, static flux of, well, I guess t. Okay, we're just gonna have a generic parameter there. Okay, and so we're gonna say uh, that we want to do in dot do on next, right? So what we're gonna do here is we're gonna provide a a callback that gets invoked whenever there is any kind of a um, processing. Okay, actually we could do do on each as well. That's probably uh, you know, more interesting. I don't know if that's more interesting. It might be. Um, yeah. So let's do do on next. I suppose that's the, that's the first step. Okay. And we're gonna all we're gonna do here is we're gonna consume the string, and then we're going to say subscribe on, and we're gonna su subscribe on a custom scheduler. Well, the question then of course is what set what scheduler? So I'm gonna create one. Um, well, I guess I don't need the final, but scheduler, scheduler equals schedulers dot uh, from executor, executors dot new fixed thread pool. All right, there you go. So there's my new scheduler, and I'm creating a custom scheduler. Should you ever do this? Probably not, right? Most of the time, your scheduler will be the default one, which is backed by the number of by a number of threads that correspond to the number of cores you've got, and each one acts as an event loop. And so long as no none of your uh, processing monopolizes uh, the thread on which it's running, that is to say, it doesn't do anything longer than it takes to switch to the I/O, then you don't really need this, right? You don't need to manage this. But if you are doing something with JDBC or something that blocks otherwise, like Fibonacci or cryptography or Bitcoin or whatever, that work should be done on um, a, 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 you know, you have to scale out that interaction by having more threads. And so it might become useful to do this. In this case, I'm just going to provide extra threads. All right. So there we go. I'm overriding. I'm changing the incoming publisher by first of all, configuring that I want to log out the information. I'm going to log out that information by using a log for J logger uh, that I'll plug in. Okay, so log.info t, and of course, this could be written as a lambda, and that can be written as a method reference, like so. All right, very good. So that's not so bad. So we're going to say prepare, all right, one, and prepare two. And there we go. Okay. And there's my combined, you know, pre processed publisher. And I'm just going to return the combined one. All right. So now let's just say, we say, return read. All right. And now we can restart this application. Let's see what we get. Go, go, go. Suppose we can inline this while we're piddling around here. Good. <clears throat> Mm. IntelliJ still thinks we have the old one that the old uh, public static void main on which we uh, settled when we first initialized the project. So that's no longer true. Alrighty. So now curl uh, HTTP localhost 8080 forward slash data. All right. Very simple. All right. There's our data. And when we log it out, we can see that things are executing on different threads, right? The number is executing on thread three. Here's the combined one on thread three as well. Here, both letters and oh, uh, that's all the letters that's on thread two. Uh, and here is thread three for the numbers. 
but here is thread four for the combined one. So it was on thread three for the combined one, and then it was on com on thread uh, four. So you can see that the scheduler, based on whatever criteria it needs to, it moves work around different threads, and that's that's uh, one of the features, right, of the reactive API. All right, but that does make things a bit more complicated. That means that we can't take for granted that if we insert something in a, in a well-known place here, that that data will then be visible and accessible to everything happening in this pipeline by the by this point here, right? We can't that we can't take that for granted because while these things may look imperative, while it may look as though we've written these things to be sequential, the fact of the matter is that these things could be contemporaneous. They could be concurrent, right? Things might be happening at the same time. On different threads uh, and uh, so we need to to rely upon some other mechanism one way to do that is to provide a subscriber context okay now though a, a, a context is an object that is it's just a dictionary basically it's a dictionary that you have access to um, in in your pipeline that uh, that um, reactor will take care to perpetuate for you right uh, and the benefit of that is that you can make this data available. You can make this data um, available at the very beginning of the pipeline. And even if it moves across different thread boundaries, it'll be visible only to the stages in that pipeline. It doesn't matter which thread it's running on. So we can use that to pro propagate, for example, uh, you know, application tokens and headers and uh, uh, authentication principles and uh, transactions and, uh, you know, whatever thing you want to be accessible for the lifetime of a of a given publisher okay so let's do that we're gonna we have here this uh, prepare method um, let's just try it with just this one okay so I'm gonna give this a subscriber context okay I'm gonna say subscriber context and my job is very simple given a context return a context and I can do whatever I want with the context I can change it I can overwrite it I can contribute to it etc Etc. Etc. So that's one option, and um, uh, you know, works for me. I could actually do a set or a put or whatever. Uh, another option is to instead just provide the reference itself using the convenient builder method. So here I can say context will be uh, UID. You know, this will be my uh, off ID or whatever. Okay, your user ID. There we go. So let's see, uh, and then we can actually store uuid dot random dot two string there we go that's a random string now that context will be visible inside um, the uh, inside the the stages of this pipeline so let's actually add that pipeline that's actually now you know because we've seen that the combined letters can execute across different threads so now let's prove that out let's say do on uh, each okay so I'm gonna create a consumer that will consume a signal. And here, the signal is a representation of what method was it called? Was it the on next? Was it on subscribe, etc.? So signal, signal. I'm gonna say if signal dot is on next, right? Or put another way, if it's not on next, then return now. Otherwise, we want to process it. We want to actually uh, you know take the data from the con from the signal. And so we can say signal dot get context, okay. And with that, we can actually look up the, uh, the the key, right? So the key is called user ID. So we can say get or default, and then we can say get um, that key. All right, there's our UID, and uh, we can log out. Log info user ID for this pipeline stage for data and then this will be signal dot get the string dot is signal or is user ID rather so here I'm logging out the uh, the data that's in the on next method call and then I'm logging out the user ID that's been perpetuated along with that with that interaction. Okay, let's try this out. Mm. 
There you go. Look at that. So now, when I make the request, user ID for this pipeline stage for A1, B2, and C3 is exactly the same thing. Now, keep in mind, uh, this one, these are both on thread 10. These are both on you know, different threads. So you can see we have the fact that these things are being moved across different threads. This is 9. That's A1. And here's the same thing, thread 9. So that's here's thread 10 for the uh, B2. C3 is on, B, is on 10 as well. OK, pretty straightforward, right? I mean, you can kind of see what's happening here. We just use the subscriber context to create a context object, which acts as basically a dictionary. And you can see that of, there's a bunch of them here you, you know, that, that, you can, that you can work with. Or you could provide a, a, a transforming function that takes the current context. And you can use that to create a new context that has the existing values from the existing context uh, and that also has new values that you want to insert in there. Okay, so that's the the theoretical, and this is used to great effect in Spring, for example, uh, in uh, in Spring Security, right? So if you go to Spring Security here, we're going to look for the um, the Reactor Context Web Filter. Reactor Context Web Filters Security. Okay, and that's uh, on GitHub. There you go. And uh, this code, for example, is in Spring Security and in the integration for reactive code. And this is actually a reactive web filter, right? This is a Spring web Webflex filter. It's not a servlet filter, it's a Webflex filter. Um, and um, it, in turn, has a method called filter, which takes a current HTTP request and a chain. And we configure the filter. We say chain.filter exchange, propagating you know, allowing things downstream to contribute to the, the pipeline, the reactive pipeline. And then finally, at the very tail end of that, we add a subscriber context, taking the current context, checking to see if it has a key. If it does, then return it. Otherwise, we create a new context, um, uh, or actually, we, we alter the context by adding the security context to it. So the, react, so the Spring Security security context is a thing that holds the currently authenticated user. So when you make a HTTP post or a, a form-based login, that information gets passed to some sort of authentication manager, which then either confirms uh, the you know it confirms that this is the person or client or whatever that uh, is claiming you know it, that it is claiming to be, and if that's the case, it then stashes that resulting authentication object somewhere. Well, that's the security context holder, um, and in turn, that's the context that's made available through this filter at the very beginning of all web requests in Spring Webflux. So now, anywhere in your code in Spring Security, you can inject the current authenticator principle because Spring Security can look at the current pipeline that's been modified by this reactive web filter and look at the context and extract out this object of type security context class. That's the other thing. I'm using a key here. But imagine I wanted to store some more interesting kind of data. I could say stat, you know, class user ID, right? And I could do something like this, right? String UID. Well, certainly, you know, I could do that. And that would be, here I can say, instead of using a key, I could use a class type, right? And I could stash that and have that perpetuated along with the, the pipeline as well. Obviously, the uh, smaller the data, the better, but the point is you can do both, okay? All right, so that's a very simple abstract idea, and I, I hope with Spring Security you can see the possible applications now. Let's be a little bit more concrete here. Uh, I'm going to take an example taken directly, not even like I'm, I'm not even going to bother uh, writing this. I, I don't even have to write this, you know, uh, myself. I didn't even have to imagine this. There's a great example by Reactor Team uh, Legend and uh, uh, Reactor uh, Reactive Ninja Extraordinaire Simon Basley um, uh, that is from Simon Basley. Uh, contextual logging. Let's see if I can find this. This amazing blog. Okay, so this blog uh, from earlier this year uh, looks at using the MDC, looking at the reactor context object, and using it as a way to perpetuate the MDC, the, the context that's made available for logging. So when you log out stuff in your logs, you have information, keys, and values that can be associated with that log. 
that has traditionally, historically, been based on a thread local. And so in this blog, Simon uh, looks at how to, to uh, you know, rework things ever so slightly to take advantage of um, the new context object in Reactor. So I'm just going to show you that. That's actually what we're going to see next. It's a very simple example, and it demonstrates things beautifully, uh, beautifully. So I, I'm rather than do something completely different, which would fail to meet the standard that he has set, I'm just going to use that. So we're going to create a very simple um, MDC application. And this application, it's going to be a Spring Boot application. It's going to be, uh, I'm going to have a logger, and it'll be a REST controller. And what we're going to do is we're going to demonstrate that we can respond to an HTTP request. And in providing that response, we can uh, associate information with the request that gets visible that's then made available to the logging context the, the logging uh, uh, master data context okay so uh, what I'm going to do now is create a service just as he did a restaurant service and the service come on the service will provide a answer to the question of which restaurants can we visit visit um, by max price. All right, there we are. And we'll just use a double and price. All right. And we're going to have a DTO here, class restaurant, double price per person, private string name. All right. This will be public static void main. Wouldn't get very far without that, I expect. All right, spring application, spring application dot run, MDC application dot class, args. Ah, very good. So there we go. There's that. Right now, what are we going to do? We're going to provide a application uh, that has constructors. All right, and we're going to return the data. So we're going to return the data here and the data we're just gonna have some hard-coded data I'm gonna just hard code some data because I don't actually have a database connected to this though of course it's all reactive so we could talk to R2DBC we could use uh, reactive MongoDB we could use reactive Couchbase or Cassandra or uh, Redis anything would work just fine but I am just gonna synthesize some data for our demo in the constructor here and in order to do that I am going to create a um, collection of data, a hard-coded restaurants. Okay, private, final, um, collection. Okay, restaurant. Restaurants equals new concurrent skip list set. Alrighty, and that has to be comparable. So we'll say new comparator. I'm going to say o one dot get price per person. Uh, I'm going to do uh, double one uh, two return one dot compare to two all right and we'll uh, create that collection and in the collection we're just gonna have some data I'm just gonna write some data the old-fashioned way by generating it. So I'll say um, int stream dot. Uh, I guess I just want to build a range. Let's just build a range zero to a thousand dot map to object uh, i i integer dot to string restaurant i. Uh, okay, so that'll be my string. Oh. Uh, that's Okay. New restaurant, and it'll be um, a, a double. So we'll say new random dot next double. Hello. Dot hundred. Okay. And then the name will be string. And then for each one of those, I guess we can just we want to set that as a we want to add that to the uh, 
the, the, the collection there. So um, for each this dot restaurant collection add, right? Okay, seems fairly straightforward. Okay, so we're just gonna start up the application in the constructor. We're gonna write a bunch of records to that collection, which is gonna be comparator. It's optimized for reading, not for writing. That's why it's it's not it's probably not a great fit, but whatever. It's a demo. Okay, very simple demo. Um, and this is no longer true. Good. Restaurants. Okay, so there's our data. Now here's our publisher. Here's our reactive endpoint, and we're gonna say. Assuming that we find a record, we're going to say um, uh, get the data. This dot this dot restaurants dot uh, uh, parallel streams. If I suppose filter, we're going to say uh, restaurant, uh, and then that will be. Um, we're going to say restaurant dot get price per person less than or equal to max price. All right, so that'll be. A stream of restaurant that matches our predicate here okay simple and from that we can create a publisher so flux dot from stream says okay so that's the that's the basic demo okay that's pretty simple right we're gonna create a little rest controller here just in case to have that in, that data so um, user ID you know prices Whatever restaurants, restaurants. Um, let's just make this easy. Okay, so I'm gonna assume a price as a category, as a, as a, um, as a uh, discriminator here. But I want the user ID information to be visible in the life of the uh, of the request. So I'm gonna say uh, that this is the path variable. And you can use request parameters as well. I don't, it doesn't really matter here. And the double will be um, path variable double price. All right. So we want to inject the restaurant service like so. And then already return this dot restaurant service dot get by max price price and I want that context when I log out the information in this publisher in this uh, reactive publisher what I want to do is I want to log out um, information about the search then I want to log out the results of the search uh, and then I want to log out uh, the current you know the current application ID so let's now transform our little publisher here Okay, so uh, private static. Um, well, I suppose we could do that. Okay, t consumer t log on next, and this will be a consumer log statement. Okay, so there's my um, my handler. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to change this. I'm going to change, um, you know, uh, void uh, adapt results. Okay, so I'm going to take the flux of restaurants in, and we'll do work with it. So I'm going to say adapt. You could do this with a filter, certainly. Results and I will return a flux of restaurant as before. And here's where we're going to do all the work of sort of changing this result. So we're going to say uh, first return mono.just um, string.format. So we're going to log out the beginning of the, the pipeline, finding restaurants. Uh, and I guess we can actually um, pass in the price UID. And the price. Uh, okay, string double price. Um, having price lower than. Okay, so it'll be dollar sign 
for that user ID. Okay, and then we're going to use string that format. So UID, or sorry, price UID, and from there I'm going to say do on each, and I'm going to log out the results that come back. So log on next, and this will just be on the, in the consumer that I pass into this method. All I'm going to do is log, and with that I'll then say. Um, I want to get the results, so restaurant service dot uh, get by max price. And actually, we already have that, don't we? So we don't need to we don't need to do the search. We just pass that along, okay? And then from there, uh, I want to log some more data. So I'll say uh, here. Remember, the restaurant data will be what we get back at this point. So here, I'm going to say log dot info. Um, found restaurant for okay, and it'll be r dot get name r dot get price per person, and then finally I'm gonna set the subscriber context. So I'll say context dot of API ID, and it'll be the um, UID I suppose. That's what I'm. That's what I really want to encode there. Okay. So what's wrong with this now? Oh, do on each. Clearly. Okay. Hmm? What is the problem? We are going to ah. We want this to be a signal of T. Okay. So that's going to be a restaurant. Perfect. All right. So we've got that. That restaurant was a little redundant and it was hiding a problem that was real. I'm glad we fixed that. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to say in this method. This is where the actual work gets done. So, found restaurant. Okay, it's a ristorante in Italian with an I. So forgive me if the spelling is all weird. All right. So now we have uh, our simple job. Given a signal, we're going to return a. I'm going to say if signal is on next, or if it's not rather, then just return. Okay. But then. Um, we want to get the data out of the current context. So I'm going to say APID like so. And we're going to ask for the current context get or empty. And the empty, we're going to look for the APID, that's or UID, I suppose is what we're calling it. Uh, and I'm going to say, okay, if that's not null, um, we're going to process. If it's there, we're going to use it. If it's not, we're going to process. Uh, and I, I made a mistake. I generated this project using Java 1.8, but let's use 11. 11 actually is a better version anyway, and there's some nice APIs here that make what I want to do here just a little bit easier. Okay. Okay, so what I want to do is I want to say, if that ID is there, I'm going to say, give me it, or an optional that's empty. I'm going to say, okay, um, API ID dot if present or else. So if it's there, use it, otherwise run the runnable. That doesn't exist in Java 8, but it's there in Java 9. Uh, or 11 in this case. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say um, if it's there, there's a consumer of string if present, right? And the present, you know, if it's there, I'll say um, let's just say UID. Otherwise, runnable, run or else. Okay, not bad, huh? 
So in the runnable, will be very simple. We just say uh, we're gonna log the data out. Uh, let's say log statement dot accept, and um, we're gonna call signal dot get. So I'm logging. I'm, remember, this method takes a consumer. In the consumer, I'm passing in the value that's that's been emitted, and I can do with it whatever I want. Um, if it's there, however, I want to take the UID and attach it to the current MDC. And I can do this conveniently using the auto-closable feature here. So there's an MDC closable. So I can say try closable equals MDC that put closable. So it'll be alive for the scope of this uh, demo of, of this interaction, but no longer, right? That's convenient. So while you know inside there, uh, let me put this up here. Dot run. Okay, so it's a little confusing. I grant you. If present or else. So let's review here. What's happening? In this consumer, which gets run on every each incantation, I guess we could have called this on each, uh, but actually we only care about the on next event. That's what we're doing as we're filtering those out. If we're running on an on next event or method or whatever, then we look at the current context and we ask for a, uh, let's actually just call this UID just to be consistent. And in fact, I could have extracted all of this out and I could, have, I could certainly have done a better job here. Private final static string UID, UID, and we'll use the same key everywhere, whether it's in the context or in my MDC scope uh, or anything else. Okay, so that'll make things a little bit simpler. And I'm going to rename this to UID optional. There we go. Okay, so now we can see um, I'm going to have some sort of UID that's that's been packaged along the scope, uh, been packaged along the, the the life of this publisher, and that UID, um, I'll access here inside of this on next callback. If the on next method gets called, then I'll uh, I'll check and see if it's on next. If it is on next, then I will run um, this block of code, attaching the data from the current context that has the UID adding it to the current MDC context for the logger uh, under the same key. It doesn't have to be the same key. It could be anything you want, but I'm going to attach it that way. And of course, once I'm once it's attached, then I'll run the actual thing that does the work that we want to do, which is the callback here, the, the consumer that the client code will pass to us. So I'm just calling logs. I'm basically invoking the function that somebody has given me. Uh, I'm calling, uh, I'm going to invoke it with the value that's been, you know, that's been provided for me in the uh, current signal in the current iteration, the current value that's been emitted. Okay. Um, so either it's present, either the UID is present in the reactor context, in which case I insert it into the uh, logging MDC and then I run the consumer or it's not present, in which case I just run the consumer. But either way, this has to get run. It's just a matter of whether we set up anything inside of the MDC before we run it. Okay. So that's the basic thing that sets up the reactor context. Uh, let's see, found two, expecting one. What did I miss? Oh, all right, is that right? Looks right. Uh, there, that should work. Okay, that's better. So now, the only thing that remains, of course, is to set up a logging pattern so that we can actually see um, how this gets logged out, and that's pretty easy to do in Spring Boot. So we're just going to customize the logging pattern here. Uh, pattern console equals, uh, and we want to say pound magenta uh, thread cyan x uid. Okay. Highlight 
five level logger thirty six dot m message n and there we go that's our um our custom logger that should kick in so you can see up until now I've gotten this sort of default spring boot logging pattern which is fine works just fine but uh, we want to see that current app ID so let's do that or the current UID oops ports already running applications already running on the same port rather so let's stop it and restart just the MDC application okay it's up and running and now I want to go visit this endpoint I'm going to say um, one two and this is going to be restaurants and the price will be well, actually we don't know what price we have do we um, you should have logged out those prices well I suppose statistically something is going to be less than that Okay, so JQ dot uh, name uh, looks about right. Let's see, statistically, let's just see, is that smaller? Yeah, okay, so it's diminishing. If I choose something, you know, statistically, only 1% of the results is gonna be less than one, right? So so that's uh, that's about fine, okay? Um, less than or equal to, rather. And so when I make these requests, now, Um, let's see. Now I want to log out the information, don't I? So, what do we have here? Log statement. Log info. Log info. Found restaurant. Get name. Here's the thread. Here's the app ID, right? Where is this 12? 12. We have 12 restaurants. So now if I change this to be 15, you can see it says 15. So it's actually associating the request with a thread. Uh, it's very hard to sort of prove this otherwise. I mean, let's see, curl, it should be a local host, 80, 80, you know, 20 restaurants one or two whatever one okay so there's two different sets of data I've actually just got two sets of results there but now we should see 20 and 15 and so on okay so this is a, a very simple example but it does demonstrate how useful this API is it's nice that the MDC API here in SL4j is so convenient you can just uh, it's an abstraction so we can easily in a generic way insert things in the context um, it's nice that we have this uh, this API. You can use it in other ways if you want. There's, I'm sure you can think of things that you would like to perpetuate along the life cycle of a given reactive pipeline. This is how you would do that. Uh, you just add things to the to the uh, context, to the subscriber context, uh, and then you can pull those things out in either your, your handlers uh, or anywhere else in the pipeline. You could stash it somewhere. You could do all sorts of interesting things. So my friend, with that, thank you so much for watching and thank you again to Seaman Bosley who's got that great example who's bl and, and for the blog, uh, which you should all definitely go read. Uh, remember, this mechanism, it, it underpins a lot of what we do, transaction demarcation in uh, and, and security context propagation, all these kinds of things that you can imagine wanting to do in the old in the old world using thread locals, you can now do in Reactor. And I think this is one of those things that sets Reactor ahead of uh, uh, some of the other technologies in the same sort of category, the same pack, because this is actually one of those things that a lot of them don't have. So uh, I think it's a pretty interesting place to be. All right, with that, 
with that, my friends, like I said, thank you so much for watching, and uh, with that, we'll see you next time.